Masterclass Master Series 60 Minutes Palliative Wound Care streaming live and also available on demand at the Hartman Link Hub as well as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, Big Marker, YouTube and the Wound Masterclass website. Welcome to Master Series on Palliative Wound Care. We're going to be talking about the challenges and solutions in the next 60 minutes with this esteemed global panel. Um, joining us, we've got Dr. Thomas and Prof. Sebastian Probst, and we've also got Professor Georgina Gethin. So welcome to our panel. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, would you like to tell us a little bit about your clinical practice? Uh, if I come to you first, Professor Sebastian. So um, I'm a professor of tissue liability and wound care at the University of Applied Sciences and Arts Western Switzerland in Geneva and the University Hospital in Geneva. So my, um, uh, and I'm the immediate past president of uh, Yuma. <clears throat> so uh, my, um, my clinical practice is uh, uh, mainly venous leg ulcers uh, and uh, palliative wounds and uh, I did also my PhD in uh, palliative wounds, in oncological wounds. Uh, so this is one of my um, big um, uh, subjects that I treat. I also wrote the standard for Switzerland and the standard for the EONS, Oncological Nursing Society. And currently we are develop developing um, a guideline for UMA, for the European Wound Management Association, um, in regards of palliative wounds. So my main focus is also research and uh, research in venous leg ulcers, but also in uh, palliative uh, wounds and they're mainly uh, fungating wounds. Right, thank you. And over to you, Dr. Thomas, do you look like you have a very exotic backdrop to your screen today? <laughs> um, I'm John Thomas. I have done wound care for the last 14 years. Uh, prior to that, I was a, a internal medicine physician working in the hospital, but for the last 14 years, all I've done is wound care. Uh, I've opened my own practice. Uh, we have a huge limb salvage program where we do all the vascular work in our clinic itself. And my sole purpose at this point in my life is to advance wound care as it's being done today. Thank you very much. And thank you also to you, Professor Gethin, for joining us uh, for this panel. So I'm Professor of Nursing in the School of Nursing and Midwifery in University of Galway in Ireland. So we'll come to you first, uh, Professor Gethin. Now uh, you're going to talk to us a little bit about how we can define the palliative wound. Good morning or good evening or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. And you're very welcome to this presentation as part of the Wound Masterclass series dedicated to palliative wound care. Uh, I want to thank Hartman for the sponsorship and also to Boone Masterclass for the opportunity to present to you today. So the remit for me for today is to look at defining the concept of palliative wound care, but also to perhaps understand why that is important. Why do we need to define a concept? It's more than perhaps an academic exercise. And it's actually a very powerful thing to have a concept well-defined. And we're going to look at that uh, over the next 20 minutes or so. Before I start, I just want to say I have no conflict of interest to declare for this work. So I want to thank them all for their excellent collaboration and for the work to date in this really important area. So perhaps to start. So the World Health Organization defines palliative care, and they did this in 2002 as an approach that improves the quality of life of patients and their families facing the problems associated with life-threatening illness through the prevention and relief of suffering by means of early identification and impeccable assessment and treatment of pain and other problems, physical, psychosocial, and spiritual. And indeed, it's a very comprehensive uh, definition, but like many things, it's not without its critics. And the Lancet Commission then, in, they perhaps looked at palliative care and they also looked at the World Health Organization um, definition of it. And in their very powerful document, they looked at alleviating the access abyss in palliative care and pain relief. 
and which is imperative of universal health coverage. And this was a very um, stark document because for many of us here in, you know, we're here in Ireland, we've got really good access to services and perhaps we maybe take for granted many things that we have. But they show that around the world, this is not the case. And even in something as basic as morphine for pain relief is not accessible by thousands of people, which is it, it really makes us stand and think about what we mean by services, what we mean by care. And they developed a, a conceptual framework which measured the global burden of what they call serious health related suffering. And they divided that into two areas. They say that suffering is health related when it's associated with illness or injury of any kind. And it's serious when it cannot be relieved without medical intervention and it compromises physical, social or emotional functioning. And it said, therefore, the palliative of care should be focused on relieving serious health suffering that is associated with life limiting or life threatening conditions or the end of life. So it is very much saying that palliative care is not simply or is not confined to end of life care, but it goes across this spectrum. And that's important for us when we consider the boundaries of palliative wound care. And it recommended, therefore, that the definition should be reviewed and revised to encompass health system advances and importantly, low income settings where medical professionals often have difficult task of looking after people without the necessary medicines, equipment or training indeed. And it went on to say that it recommends a def definition that explicitly rejects any time or prognostic limitation on access to palliative care. This goes back again to their, you know, including serious health suffering and not limiting it to end of life care. And in the second part, it treats palliative care as an essential component of comprehensive care for persons with complex, chronic or acute life-threatening or life-limiting health conditions that should be practiced by all healthcare and social care providers and by palliative specialists and that can be provided in any healthcare setting including a person's own home. So this led to an excellent document which was to redefine palliative care and importantly in this it was a consensus-based definition. So this was led by the International Association for Hospice and Palliative Care. And I just want to show you a little bit about the process that's involved in coming up to this new consensus based definition, because that is critical in understanding who is behind something, who are the thinkers, who who does this actually apply to? So they used a three phased approach, which involved healthcare professionals from countries in all income levels. And that was critically important to their work. In phase one, 38 palliative care experts evaluated components of the World Health Organization definition and suggested new or revised ones. In phase two, they had 412 international associations for hospital and palliative care across 88 countries. And they expressed their level of agreement with these components. And in phase three, the expert panel developed the definition. And just to provide you a mapping of where they included not only the number of countries, the number of representatives from various countries, and importantly, that this was spread over high, upper middle and low middle or low income countries. And their final definition said that palliative care is the active holistic care of individuals across all ages with serious health-related suffering due to severe illness and especially those near the end of life. So importantly, it's not limited to end of life, but it is says, yes, especially those at end of life. And it aims to improve the quality of life of patients, their families and their caregivers. And some further work then started to tease this out in terms of palliative wound care. How does that, you know, how, how do we move this forward? And this, and we won't go into the methodological approach that was used here, was an AQ methodology. And they looked at this approach and they looked at how nurses actually 
how they frame palliative wound care. And what was interesting in this was that treatment of patients is influenced significantly by the perceptions and subjective frames of reference of wound care nurses towards what is palliative wound care. And that goes back to the earlier point that actually it is important, therefore, to have a concept or a definition, which therefore reduces or at the very least minimizes this subjective uh, notion of what is palliative wound care, what is not, and therefore who receives treatment from various specialists and who does not. And a common trait that was shared across all four Q factors was the perception of palliative wound care as an approach to improving the quality of end of life. So in this perception, it was very clear that the, the focus was actually very, very narrow, but it did include holistic patient care, family support, effective communication and teamwork. And they looked at the four subjective frames, therefore, by which wound care nurses are uh, follow. Focusing on care within the boundary of current patient demands, comparing continuously the priorities on wound healing and disease care, preparing and preventing from worsening via tracking care in advance, and moving forward with a clear direction by confronting the co declining condition. But I think the first of those is probably most reflective of where we're at because it says focusing on care within the boundary of current patient demands or patient needs. So it really is very patient focused. This is not a one size fits all. So through the task force that I mentioned earlier, we wanted, therefore, to try and define what is the concept of palliative wound care through a scoping review of the literature. And we wanted to do this through a methodologically sound approach that would therefore be accepted by all. We use this meta aggregative approach. And there was four stages, developing of the question and the search strategy, the literature searches, screening and data collection, pooling of the data, and then further analysis should it be required. We included any report, definition, concept, components, anything that was out there that was related to palliative wound care and that followed any methodology and design published at any time. So we really want, if it's out there, we will find you. We wanted to include this in our review. We searched across all of the major databases, including EBSCOhost, CINAHL, Ovid, Cochrane, all of, the, all of the major databases. We found over two and a half thousand records and these were all screened. We then looked at the full text of almost 200 of those and 133 were included in the final data synthesis, which is a very large scoping review. But that's what a scoping review is aimed to do. It's trying to catch so much information all at once. But interestingly, most of the reports were from or led by authors from the United States, the United Kingdom and Canada. And that goes back to the work of the International Hospice and Palliative Care Group, where they were looking to define it. And they were very, very strong in including all countries, all income settings. But in palliative wound care, our definitions and our scope are very limited actually to these Western countries. So it's arguably, does our final definition apply across other areas? It did include systematic reviews, editorials, case studies, observational studies, posters. If it was there, as I say, we included it. One of the nice things about it was that it included across a range of etiologies. And this was really important because, as I say, palliative care, palliative wound care is often viewed from the lens of cancer care. So you would expect that much of it was therefore focused around malignant fungating wounds. However, we found the opposite, which was good. Almost a half, 46 percent had a broad, broad range of wound etiologies, but 26, 22 percent included malignant fungating wounds and then all others. So this was really strong. The most repeatedly used phrases right throughout were unsurprisingly about symptom management and quality of life, also psychological or psychosocial issues and symptom control. And three themes emerged from that. Palliative wounds, looking at the types of wounds, the healing potential and the patient population that they affected. The impact on individuals and families, 
which included things like social isolation and distress, quality of life, function and well-being. And then the care approaches. What were the goals, principles and existing needs of patients? So our new concept, and this has been submitted for publication, and we would hope that it will be available very uh, soon. And it may seem a little bit long, but it's trying to capture all of the various core elements of what palliative wound care is. So it is person and family centered. It is holistic and interdisciplinary care of wounds that may heal or not, or may be too onerous to treat, including but not limited to symptom control and management for individuals who are often vulnerable and have impaired quality of life. And this, as I say, is from 133 papers, which are distilled out of almost just 2,600 uh, titles and abstracts that we screened. So how does our definition of palliative wound care compare with that of palliative care? So it actually compares very well because it includes being person-centered, being holistic, multidisciplinary, not limited to end-of-life care, not certainly not limited to cancer care and with a large focus on quality of life and arguably quality of life of the patient, but also quality of life of families and carers. So the concept, therefore, of palliative wound care leads us then to what are the differences between palliative and curative wound care? And Edmonds and Lockman did quite a lot of work on this back in 2010, but actually the principles of what they have uh, have hold, held through even to today. Essentially, in general wound care, the goal is healing. It can be to eliminate causative factors, for example, um, pressure in the area of pressure ulcers, to provide systemic support to reduce existing and potential cofactors, and to maintain a local environment that promotes healing. When the goal is palliative, the focus is on symptom management, psychological well-being, multidisciplinary team approach and a focus on patient and family goals. Now, one could argue that actually a multidisciplinary approach is required in all cases. And in fact, it is. But in the area of palliative wound care, it's more evident and it's more necessary on a day to day basis. So, for example, pain is one of the major factors that patients encounter, and that requires a pain specialist. So there's much more engagement and interaction on an ongoing basis. Focusing on patient and family goals, constantly assessing what are the needs of the patient, what are their goals? It may be, for example, elimination of odour, control of bleeding. It could be some of these. So, yes, there are similarities between the two, but the major difference is the focus is not on healing the focus is on the symptom management and alongside of that, a major focus on psychological well-being. Recently, Professor Probst and I did update it, in fact, a chapter in the Oxford textbook of palliative medicine, where we looked at skin problems in palliative care. And where, what we did in this was we used the time based approach in order to look and see how we would address or how we would approach palliative wound care compared to general wound care. And what were the principles of that? I'm not going to go into all of those because it would be it would be too long and it would, it's a resource and I have the reference for it there. But using the time, an acronym, using tissue infection, inflammation, moisture and the edge or epithelial edge advancement, looking at, for example, in the case of necrotic tissue, it may be to debride the uh, necrotic tissue. And then what sort of agents can be used that may be suitable? But bearing in mind, it will very much depend on a comprehensive assessment of the patient and the wound and of the goals of care. So the palliative wound care framework, therefore, it's driven by patient and family goals, integrated with management of palliation of the underlying cause, management of these four major wound related symptoms, pain, odour, exudate and bleeding, and management of wound and peri-wound skin. So in summary, palliative wound care is not time limited and it's focused on patient and family goals. The concept of palliative wound care is really important because if you've got a clear concept, this can guide policy, it can guide resource allocation and it can guide service provision. Major wound symptoms include, as we've said, 
pain, odor, exudate, and bleeding. It differs from general wound care in many areas, but particularly for the outcome of healing. And I would urge and certainly support that we need critical research to develop this area of practice in order that we have interventions to support this group of patients into the future. So I want to thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much again for the opportunity to meet with you all, even though it's virtually. And if there's any questions that you have, I'm happy to take them. So Dr. Thomas, do you want to talk to us a little bit about um, the other types of wounds that might affect patients that are at the end of life? Well, there's multiple different wounds that, that can affect patients at the end of life. Uh, we certainly are talking here today about palliative wounds and uh, those are the wounds that we look at that, that are just not amenable to healing at this point in time and is not focused in what the patient's desires are. Um, so they, they can be any kind of wounds from venous wounds to uh, chronic osteomyelitis um, to just any, any type of wound where the goal is no longer uh, aggressive healing, but to maintain the environment and prevent the wound from becoming a uh, issue for the patient. Thanks very much. And Professor Sebastian, what do you think is the sort of um, biggest misconception in general wound practice about palliative care wounds? Well, palliative wound care is a little bit neg neglected and um, it's not very well known in the, in the field of chronic wounds. Here we have, as um, Dr. Thomas already said, um, we want to maintain the quality of life of the patients. And we go mainly towards uh, symptom management uh, to have a better, as I said, a better quality of life. And uh, there we can, um, and we will talk about this during also my talk, um, we can use um, dressings to um, um, lower, for example, wound odor, and so to enhance this uh, quality of life. Fantastic. Well, Dr. Thomas, shall we come to you to find out what are the challenges faced uh, in palliative wound care? So the aims and objectives um, to identify the challenges in daily practice, to the uh, challenges in the management of palliative care wounds, and examples of skin damage and palliative wounds. So the, the goals that we look at um, pain management as one of the main goals. It uh, really affects patients' quality of life. And at this point, we really want to offer the best quality of life towards the patient. Uh, symptom control, this is encompassing wound odor management, uh, preventing wound complications, uh, education support for caregivers, and honoring the patient's preferences and goals. Odor control is one of the key components of palliative wound care. Uh, we have found that. Uh, we become desensitized to the odor working in wound care and after being around a patient for a period of time. But one of the key factors is the, that children don't want to be around odor. And as the patient who's wanting to be around their, their grandchildren and, and other family members, it's really important that we maintain an environment where they feel that they can do that. Uh, if we don't control the odor, the, uh, the family does not really want to spend time with that loved one. So that's one of the key components for me is, is odor management as well as pain management. So the challenges that we look at in palliative care, uh, patients often have complex wounds, uh, all types of wounds from pressure injuries to chronic disease, vascular impairment or malignancies. Um, the symptom control is, is really important to uh, handle the exudative drainage and malodor. The drainage can be overwhelming at times from some of these wounds, and, and you need a highly absorbing dressing that will control the odor and keep the wound from macerating and cr creating further complications. Um, it's uh, easier for a, a saturated wound to become infected and have significant malodor. Zetavit has a wonderful dressing. And in fact, in my opinion, it's, it's probably the best dressing in wound care today. Uh, the Zetavit Silicone Plus dressing has a, a single 
use sterile dressing. It's a super absorbent polymer, an SAP. It's a five layer dressing that absorbs a tremendous amount of fluid. There's been multiple studies that have been done on this that, that shows uh, how it helps to decrease odor and control drainage in the wound. These, these are really key factors in trying to uh, deal with the uh, palliative wound. Uh, I would encourage all of you to, to read up on these studies and to take a look at that and consider this type of dressing for your uh, wound, wound care patient. Sebastian, would you like to come in on this one? And there are different um, dressings showing the, um, the absorption of bacteria and MMPs, and uh, there are different dressings on the market. And you see on the upper um, graph, the different kind of dressings that are available on the market that are lowering the um, bacteria load, uh, uh, be it in the dressing or uh, they release their um, component to eradicate the, um, the bacteria and, uh, the, um, and to lower the load of MMPs. And I would suppose, I guess, that from your perspective, all three of you, is that essentially that odor management is such a big problem for the patients in palliative wound care. And for them, possibly that's the most important as well, you know, alongside pain as the two most important factors from the patient's perspective. Uh, so it's really useful to see all this evidence base behind the sequestration of bacteria and how actually that can contribute to, to lowering that bacterial load which then I guess can go on to to lessening that odor of that that wound in essence capturing that that layer that captures uh, the bacteria sequest sequestration that occurs so um well, it's really interesting for you to share that Dr Thomas that's really important document and we'll link that in the chat and if anyone has any questions please link with us in the chat and we can include all these resources that we mentioned so back to you Dr Thomas so in the uh, standard of care versus a super absorbent dressing, we see uh, a 2.9% increase in healing rate with the super absorbers. And that's simply because they keep the uh, correct environment for a wound. In palliative care, we're, we're not looking to necessarily heal the wound, but if a wound heals during palliative care, that is a, a good outcome. And so if we can assist that wound to heal or at least become a uh, lesser burden on the patient, it's certainly a goal that we want to have. Uh, it increases the quality of life and uh, saves money over a significant period of time. And I guess that might be important when we're doing sort of budgeting and health services are trying to allocate a budget to palliative wound care. Uh, essentially trying to bring those factors into play, number of dressing changes required, cost per dressing, overall, I guess, cost saving per patient as well. Yes, and especially also the cost of the nursing time, for example. And um, and I will talk a little bit later about this, about the quality of life. And that means that patients have more time with their relatives, for example. Well, in... In the United States, one of the dressings we use for odor control is a uh, charcoal dressing, which are extremely expensive. And uh, on top of a charcoal dressing, you still have to put an absorbing layer. And so a dressing such as, as Zetavit that controls the odor by controlling the bacterial load as well as controlling the drainage makes a, a cost savings. So let's find out a little bit, Dr. Thomas, about the, the common stigma misconceptions there are in palliative wound care. Well, a lot of the misconceptions we deal with in palliative care is, is people associate palliative care with hospice care or end-of-life care, and it's not necessarily the same. Uh, end-of-life care is, is much different than palliative. I had a, uh, a woman, she was 92 years old, in great health. She had multiple years ahead of her and she had a open wound to the hip with chronic osteomyelitis. The option was to treat her, but that would take six to eight weeks of her life away from her. She's 92 and to put her in an environment where we're seeing her every day and putting her on IV antibiotics and trying to treat that type of wound 
I didn't feel was appropriate for her at that time. She needed to spend her time with her family. And so we decided to make that a palliative wound. And I think that was the appropriate choice for her. It was not about end of life, but it was just about maintaining the proper wound environment and giving her a quality of life to finish out the rest of her life. Uh, one of the key concepts here is, is communication. Again, we're talking about a misconception between palliative care and uh, end of life care. And we have to communicate with all the, the family members and with the, the nursing staff and everybody to make sure that they understand the, the true goals behind what we're trying to do and what, what we're, we're, the end point is. Uh, there's also challenges with communication with the family and, and cultural and language barriers and, and handling conflicts. Sometimes patients' families don't have the same goals in mind as the patient, and it's important to make sure that they understand and are informed as the process goes along. So the uh, care coordination is, is really important. Um, the patient will be in multiple different settings from uh, their home to the hospitals to outpatient centers, and we need to make sure that we have uh, constant coordination of care. This again comes back to uh, communication, making sure that all the environments where the patient may end up uh, being understand the true goal of what the care is at this point in time. Uh, we also have the uh, psychosocial support uh, and we have to prove it, create a uh, supportive environment for the patient and the families where they feel comfortable. So really the, the challenges are to prevent complications. We talked already about uh, the drainage and, and the drainage really creates complications. And so the primary focus is uh, for comfort and symptom management. A lot of these drains are highly exudative and the exudative wounds tend to lead to infection and tissue breakdown with maceration. And so preventing complications really comes down to uh, controlling exudate and drainage. And by controlling that, you can keep the uh, odors reduced, reduce the maceration, reduce the tissue breakdown, and possibly even help the, the body to continue to heal. Pain management is a real uh, factor for the patient. Uh, one of the common issues that we have is dressing change. Dressing change tends to really hurt the patient. They, it's uncomfortable for them all the way to uh, 10 out of 10 pain. And if we can uh, create a a dressing in a environment where we decrease that pain, it, it's really helpful to the patient. Uh, the dressings, if we can change the frequency on the dressings to extend out the time period between dressing changes, uh, it will help reduce the amount of discomfort that the patient has to go through. That's why the super absorbing dressings are so uh, excellent with the uh, silicone base. The silicone base will not stick to the wound and yet it, has the super absorber that will wick away the moisture from the skin and can give us a longer uh, period of time in between dressing changes. A lot of these patients have uh, significant pain and they have uh, opioid tolerance. And so it's really important that, that we reduce the stimulation to the wound as much as possible. So some examples of the uh, skin damage in palliative care, uh, we have pressure ulcers, a lot of palliative patients tend to uh, be more sedentary and not moving. And so we start seeing uh, skin breakdown and pressure ulcers. We have to maintain an environment where we're, we're aware that the patient needs to be moved and, and keep them clean and dry, uh, particularly watching the uh, bony prominences. Uh, as, you, as you all know, when we create uh, pressure over bony prominence, we cut off oxygen circulation, nutrients to the tissues and cause breakdown. We can see that a lot in end of life care wounds like the Kennedy wounds, but in palliative, we're, we're trying to keep the patient moving, keep them going versus end of life care where we're just trying to keep them comfortable in bed. Um, as I talked about earlier with osteomyelitis, uh, they're very conservative treating on these, these types of wounds. We stop uh, 
stopping antibiotic therapy because of the highly uh, resistant bacterium and the effects of the, the antibiotics can be detrimental to the patient. And so uh, what we need to do is, is just maintain an environment that is conducive to the patient's life goals and again, reduce infection, drainage, and odor. Uh, one of the other things we see is uh, malignant wounds where they may have a malignant wound. There, there are certain things that we can do for that. Uh, one of the things is, and, and I believe uh, it'll be discussed later, is, is using wound vax on malignant wounds. The uh, wound vax are contraindicated over cancer, but when we go into palliative care, uh, we can use those to control uh, exudative flow. And it's not about healing the wound, but it's about controlling odor and drainage. So venous leg ulcers, um, those, those can be very difficult to treat. Uh, a lot of those, you, you're requiring uh, compression dressings. And patients at this point, they're, they're really tired of chronic wound care and compression dressings and these types of wounds have a lot of exudate and so you need to come up with a plan that the patient can live with where we treat the wounds keep the uh, exudate down to reduce any uh, maceration or destruction of tissue in the in the wounds we also have arterial wounds arterial wounds can be very painful and in, in this type of uh, situation, you have to realize the etiology of the wound and what you want to do, what your goals are. And that uh, sometimes, even in palliative care, we still will go ahead and do invasive uh, treatments such as uh, uh, angiogram with intervention just to decrease pain. It's not about healing the wound, but it's about making the, the pain subside and giving a better quality of life. Certainly we have uh, diabetic foot ulcers and uh, diabetic foot ulcers are, are a, a huge problem in wound care. Uh, the problem that we see with these is that the peripheral neuropathy causes a situation where the patient's not even aware that they're doing damage to a wound. And in palliative care, again, we're not trying to heal the wound, but we're trying to keep it from becoming a problem but the patient's unaware that they continue to do destruction to the wound and making things worse. So that is a real challenge to uh, come up with a plan that, that the patient can live with and that you can maintain the proper environment without uh, increasing damage to the tissues. Um, at this point in their life, they're, they're also looking at their, their diabetes and their they're really tired of being on a strict diet and, and they, they want to eat what they want to eat. And you have to work with the patient and the family members to, to let them have those pleasures in life and yet maintain blood glucose that, that will not create further problems for the wound. Surgical wounds are a, uh, another issue where we see palliative care come in. Uh, sometimes the uh, surgeons are not, uh, open to some of the, the treatments and, and plans that we have uh, because of their lack of understanding of palliative care and wound care. And so, so we have to maintain the proper environment and yet realize the, the surgeon has a strong opinion about the wound and how he wants it handled. So again, that's where communication comes in and we have to, to uh, really work with the surgeon and with the patient. Thanks very much, Dr. Thomas. I mean, those surgical wounds are such a, a key area to get healed. I, I think from a surgeon's perspective, more in the oncological setting is that they want those wounds to be healed so they can kind of instigate any sort of chemo radiotherapy that may be needed afterwards. So I suppose in that sense, it's it becomes a, a priority in order to continue treatment um, in some of these patients that have sort of the oncological patients that may be in the group that you suggested. Dr. Thomas, that was a great summary of all the challenges that, that are faced in palliative wound care. We're going to come now to uh, Sebastian to talk to us a little bit about maybe the solutions that we have as uh, 
wound care clinicians, wound care nurses uh, in that setting. Okay, it's a, it's a pleasure to talk about the quality of life of patients with a palliative wound and uh, what we can do in clinical practice to lower the symptom burden. The objectives uh, here is to identify the quality of life of these patients, the therapeutic solutions and the potential solutions, dressings and other possibilities that we have to um, lower the symptom burden. So quality of life is often more relevant for people with non-healing or palliative wounds, such as uh, malignant fungating wounds. Generally, quality of life is defined as a general perception of uh, well-being, happiness, and satisfaction by an individual. It is a subjective but dynamic concept uh, influenced by functional capacity, but also past experiences, uh, personality, self-esteem, and interprofessional relationship. Quality of life refers to a sense of well-being that is uh, specifically associated with health and illness, along with other related efforts um, to promote health management, to management disease, and to prevent uh, recurrences. For example, one quality uh, measure for a patient with a malignant fungating wound would be to prevent wound infection. And we heard about this from uh, Dr. Thomas. A quality of life goal for the same patient would be to reduce pain and prevent suffering. Striving for quality and uh, quality of life uh, outcomes in, um, time in patients with uh, palliative wounds is particularly significant when the wound healing is not uh, a realistic uh, goal or outcome. The complexity of quality of life is often understood in terms of multiple overlapping dimensions such as symptoms, general health perceptions, and uh, overall quality of life. The different uh, components may carry more importance um, at given time based on the context of health and uh, illness. So I I defined a little bit the uh, quality of life and uh, I showed a little bit the functional uh, limitations that uh, such wounds can have here, for example, resulting in the decreased ability to perform daily um, activities uh, uh, of uh, daily living, such as self-care or other um, components in the social part. Social support is very important, especially when we can engage the patient in support groups, connecting with them so that we can, um, they can talk about this or if they're not um, able to talk about uh, their wound, then to, um, to promote quality of life and to enhance that they have more time with their families. Let's go in the literature and see what is it living with a cancer diagnosis and with such a wound. This is a study uh, where I conducted and that is uh, with only one, nine women living with a malignant fungating wounds and uh, they showed um, impressively how it is very uh, difficult to deal with the unpredictable wound because it can have a lot of odor, a lot of exudate, uh, or we have problems with uh, bleeding, um, pain, and uh, other elements that are very embarrassing to, to live with such a wound. Uh, in another study, I could show that uh, caregiver experience and uh, by caregiver experience, and I found that uh, they described um, that it is a shock, uh, it is disgust and nausea 
when providing local wound care and feelings of isolation and lack of knowledge is in how to care for such a wound, and especially for their loved ones. The main conclusion of these and other studies um, is that the key to uh, improve quality of life of these patients is access to wound care, to a wound care team or to specialists um, who educate patients and caregivers on how to care for wounds uh, with uh, the appropriate dressings and how to control, for example, exudate and wound odor. As we have seen with uh, malignant fungating wounds, they have a profound um, impact on the quality of life. And um, this um, study showed um, uh, also what kind of impact it has on the relationship of uh, patients and their carers or caregivers. Um, for example, one of uh, my patients, uh, they uh, or the caregiver, the, the partner said, the radius of the movement got always smaller. So first they could travel with their wound because exudate was manageable. Then they um, went, they could only leave the house going in the garden because exodus was not manageable. And then she was uh, in the bed because it was festering, for example, like a running nose. Negative, um, the negative impact of quality of life. This is also the study of law um, et al. who showed that wound uh, pain, wound management or wound dressings are, um, are very important that, um, that the dressings have to be very comfortable, um, especially with a lot of exudent, that bleeding is important. That means that patients are informed what to do when it, uh, start, it starts bleeding and of course, uh, what to do with malodor. Here I bring you some uh, um, citations of patients um, um, that uh, show how it is living with such a wound. For example, I only eat soft cold noodles and bread because those can decrease my mouth wound pain when we talk about pain or um, the, um, the, the terms I already used, uh, this one of my patients said, I was festering like a running nose. So you can more imagine how it is to live with an exudative wound. With bleeding, for example, here it's, uh, I always suffer from bleeding after the change of dressing or slight exercise. So that means that patients stop moving and they're also sometimes afraid when healthcare professionals come to change their dressings or even if there are um, the carers, the family members that are changing the dressing. The odor, we, we were talking already a little bit earlier. Here, uh, one example, you might compare it with the smell of a piece of rotting meat. And this is what we hear very often because this, if you have, or if you have smelled it once, then you never forget how this wound smells. And therefore, we need a proper wound dressing um, to uh, lower wound odor. We've already seen from uh, Professor Gethin uh, when she defined the concept of palliative wound care that we have to uh, promote comfort, that we have to uh, uh, alleviate pain, prevent infection, to optimize the patient's quality of life and to maintain the wound in a stable and manageable state. So when we talk about wound symptom management, then we talk about these um, uh, symptoms uh, that we are discussing during this master class. So we heard already from Dr. Thomas what we can do when we have uh, um, exited. 
But I want to go a little bit further and show this is a, a publication from Kevin Wu and colleagues from Canada showing what we can do in a clinical practice. What we use is um, uh, morphine and uh, or topical lidocaine. You can also use uh, dressings with uh, ibuprofen. And um, uh, sometimes we use methadone, but, uh, but sometimes patients do not like to that we use methadone because you're nearly stamped as a drug addict. Then uh, capsaicin, uh, this can be an ointment, um, especially if you have pruritus. Um, and of course, the local wound management with the uh, automatic uh, dressings, silicone dressings, that, or dressings with a silicone contact layer that is um, recommended. If we talk about systemic, um, what we can we do systemically, then we have to know that we have uh, in these wounds or in chronic wounds in general, up to 70% of such wounds have both nociceptive and neuropathic pain. So that means um, if um, um, the, the ladder of the WHO is prescribed, so please look that you have also a painkiller against um, neuropathic pain. Then I was talking about morphine, uh, topical morphine. A critical literature review we conducted showed that um, the mixture that can be used is 10 milligrams of uh, morphine and eight grams of hydrogel. This can be mixed from um, a pharmacist and uh, then applied without any problem, even if you have um, uh, systemically applied or already some morphine that can apply it on the uh, wound bed. In palliative cases, and uh, when we have bleeding, then the, one of the classical treatment uh, can be that we have 10 times daily um, three guy of uh, fractionation uh, scheduled during weekdays in the most is that was that is the most appropriate dose. Here we can um, produce like a mummification, and then we can see that this um, um, mummification, this uh, necrosis, we can uh, keep that dry and then it falls off. Of course, it's not healed, but it's, um, it, it's an enhancement of the quality of life of these patients. Other possibilities that we have, like uh, topical hemostatic agents, is, uh, for example, uh, calcium alginates. Uh, alginates. So uh, we use that very often in clinical practice. So we have uh, um, um, the calcium that is um, hemostatic, and uh, we also have um, a change in the pH. That means we have a, a reduction of the, uh, by the, in, uh, the bacterial burden. What else can we use? And this is mostly in home care. We can use tranexamic acid. This is in ampoules or in a, in a fizz tablet. And um, there we give some instructions for the caregivers, for family members, how to use tranexamic acid, for example, for um, in the home care setting, just in case it starts bleeding. In addition to that, uh, of course, we can use other vasoconstrictors like adrenaline. Here we can soak the bulls and then we can apply it with a little bit of pressure depending on the pain also, but not more than 10 minutes because we do not want to provoke a, a, a necrosis. What we also suggest for patients uh, that have a, a tendency of bleeding, um, especially when they're taking care at home, that they use um, uh, darker uh, bed sheets. Uh, so it's, it's only psychologically, so that uh, when the family members come, come in the room and there is bleeding, so it's only dark and it's not the 
the, the, the I say bloody red, and that is uh, uh, makes a lot of panic usually for the family members. So we have heard already uh, from Dr. Thomas about exodus management. So the three indicators that are very, very important is that the dressing fits, not that there is leakage, that we have a dressing that uh, absorbs a large volume of uh, exudate because we know, for example, malignant fungating wounds, they can produce up to one liter of exudate. And of course, we want to lower the number of uh, dressing changes. So what do we use uh, for heavily or moderately exudative ulcers? We use uh, superabsorbent dressings, uh, and here are a lot on the market. And uh, we use mainly those with a silicon layer. So it doesn't adhere on the wound bed because sometimes you do the dressing change, you think, oh, um, it, this wound is festering and uh, an hour or two later, it's nearly dry. You can also use polyurethane foam dressings uh, um, or uh, in the literature, it's even uh, suggested silver impregnated foam dressings uh, uh, to lower the bacterial burden. But if you have, um, uh, uh, for example, an alginate with uh, silver, then you can cover it uh, easily with, an, for example, with a superabsorbent dressing, then you do not need a second uh, a dressing with silver. Or hydrogel dressings, uh, they are also, um, they have absorption capacities. As we, we are talking still about the wound exudate, uh, there are publications that are showing that negative wound pressure therapy um, could be one possibility in a palliative settings, setting. We know it's a contraindication for uh, malignant fungating wounds, but if we want to uh, alleviate the uh, or enhance the quality of life. And uh, we know that the patient lives only a couple of days, then it could be a possibility, for example, with 20, minus 20 to minus 40 um, uh, mm, uh, millimeters uh, mercury. So we were talking um, during this master class about the odor management. First of all, um, I think you have to reflect how you document odor, because in uh, some wound documentations, either it's yes or no, or you document it um, when you document uh, um, the, the wound or how, how the patient feels. Uh, so we have, the, for example, uh, the visual analog scale that is very often used uh, um, as a, also an as a older assessment tool. Here we have from one to 10, you know that from pain, for example, one, there is no odor, or on the 10, it's extremely uh, strong odor. Then uh, there are different rating scales. You have also the baker Hague method from uh, one to four. Um, then you have the Teller scale, that was developed by uh, Professor Dr. Patricia Crockett. This is what I see and what we do uh, is mainly we use the visual analog scale to have um, a scale that is um, to, to, uh, objective, to, to have more objective data on odor. And we usually use that also from the patient side and from the healthcare professional side. So what can we do uh, against uh, this uh, odor? And uh, this is a systematic review of topical interventions we published uh, uh, this year, where we could show, unfortunately, there is a big lack of research and in the field of palliative wound care, we know that the sample sizes are very, very low. Um, and we do not have uh, um, uh, defined outcomes where we can measure across uh, 
this um, uh, across the palliative wound care field. So what we can suggest is, uh, and what is widely used, that uh, the topical application, for example, of uh, metronidazole. So let's um, summarize. And uh, as we see that uh, the evidence um, that we have uh, available and what clinical practice shows also is that palliative wounds, uh, they can affect the quality of life. And uh, we need to have a holistic approach. And uh, the approach is to improve the quality of life. When we talk about uh, exudate, uh, then um, uh, we use mainly super absorbent dressings. Uh, we've heard several times during this uh, master class uh, or in a palliative setting. We can use also negative wound pressure therapies, therapy, and what we need is more guidelines to guide clinical practice, to guide patients um, uh, in this field. However, uh, I encourage to um, conduct uh, new research because this is lacking uh, in the field of uh, palliative wound care. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the whole panel. That was a real eye-opening um, discussion that we had with all three of you on basically the challenges, but also some really innovative solutions. Uh, so we'll now go to our live um, audience to ask any questions to the panel. So any questions that you have out there, thank you for staying with us for the last 60 minutes. Uh, please feel free to put it in the chat or if you would like to do a video question, uh, please feel free to request that as well. The question that came in, being able to manage the exudate certainly will help in managing the odor. So a dressing that can actually sequester that uh, exudate so it traps the older uh, agents within it that can be very very powerful but again try to change them uh, frequently if at all possible while still protecting the wound bed and protecting it from further irritation so they can work quite well within it so we'll keep going with some questions uh, can i start by asking you what kind of advice uh, would you give to someone who's starting out in wound care who will be you know, starting to look after some of these types of patients. What are the sort of key points that you would like them to know? I know, Sebastian, you summarized that nicely in your last slide. So maybe Dr. Thomas, I'll come to you. What do you think are sort of key pieces of advice uh, for someone that's starting out looking after these types of patients? Well, I think the key at this point is it has to be their passion. Wound care is one of the, the disciplines that a lot of people just can't do it, don't want to do it. They, they don't want to be around wounds. They don't want to be around the odors. But if you enjoy it, if it's your passion, if, it's, if you really enjoy seeing the effect that you have on, on patients, then by all means, go further in wound care. Uh, but it has to be your passion. I totally could confirm this. It's, it's a passion. It is um, also always a challenge and uh, to, to manage these wounds. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's completely different to, for example, oncology. Um, uh, and what I see is also, um, it's not a profession of itself. I think this is also um, a problem that we see, for example, in the medical field, you can have a specialization, but it's not, um, you're not the wound doctor um, uh, for itself. And uh, nursing, we have more possibilities. Uh, here we have the tissue mobility nurses, but uh, we have to start also early for um, to educate uh, nurses and physicians uh, in the field of wound care so that we can enhance the patient outcomes and uh, so and we can address all the questions uh, patients and uh, uh, their families have 
Thank you very much. And what do you, uh, all three of you, envisage as being the future of dressing technology and how that's going to impact improving the, the patient care? The future, my, my, my perspective is the future of dressings are going toward the smart dressings that um, you can uh, measure wound pH, uh, you can measure temperature, etc. And that is monitoring a little bit um, the, the wound, like a patient in the ICU, for example. And uh, that gives, for example, the healthcare professional um, uh, some uh, indications if we have to change the dressing because it's full, it's uh, of exudate, or if there is um, a local infection, so that we can uh, check that, not that the uh, patient is uh, developing, or coming too late, and then we de develop, for example, a systemic infection. I think the entire industry in wound care is advancing rapidly. I think it's on a logarithmic scale. Uh, back 14, 15 years ago, when I first got into wound care, it was rudimentary. And the area that we're at now, the, the research that has come about, the technology that's available to us now, it's, it's an exciting time to be in wound care. And again, it, this is one of those things where I said it, it has to be your passion. And if it's your passion, you get an opportunity to be on the cutting edge of, of science and wound care and doing things that have never been done before. And the really interesting thing about wound care is Every wound is different. Every wound has its own personality. And it's a problem solving issue that you have to think outside of the box, think about fixing things in ways that have never been done before. And it's just an exciting uh, practice to get to do that. Thank you so much to, to the whole panel for helping us learn how to optimize wound care in this patient group. Um, thanks again to the live audience for joining us for the questions and we look forward to seeing you for our next event. Uh, don't forget you can watch this both live as you have done and also on demand. Um, we'll provide the links in the chat. So thank you very much to Hope Powell and thank you very much to Hartman for supporting this venture today. Thank you. Thank you. Wound Masterclass Master Series 60 Minutes Palliative Wound Care streaming live and also available on demand at the Hartman Link Hub as well as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, Big Marker, YouTube and the Wound Masterclass website.